open. I had to learn that the hard way. Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We'll uh, call to order this special meeting of the Laconia City Council scheduled for 6 p.m. on Monday, May 14, 2018, in order to uh, listen to and participate in department presentations tonight concerning the fiscal year 2019 budget as it pertains to the water department, the assessing department, and the library department. And since we have three and we have at max one hour, I'm sort of going to keep an unofficial clock here to try to keep the keep things moving and keep each presentation to roughly 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes, so we finish on time. Um, I will note for the record that we have four city councilors present. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Achini, Mr. Haynes, Mr. Hamill, and Mr. Hosmer are present, and that constitutes a quorum for this meeting. So let's go ahead and get started first with uh, Seth, Seth Nuttleman and the superintendent of the water department. Welcome, sir. Good evening, Mayor, Councilman. I'd, uh, just for the record, Seth Nuttleman, um, fiscal year 18, <clears throat> excuse me, 19 budget. Um, before I get right into the numbers as far as they are, just wanted to give you a little rundown of what's happened over the last year or so. Um, drinking water has stayed in the national limelight. If you remember last year, we were talking about lead in Flint, Michigan, and this year we're talking about POFAs in the southern part of the state. So the limelight's been on us for a couple years now. Um, suffice it to say, we haven't had any issues and we don't have any issues uh, with those two contaminants. Um, you'll see coming out shortly is what's called our consumer confidence report. Our consumer confidence report basically will give you an insight into all the testing that we perform on the drinking water, and that's over 2017, and we have met or exceeded all state and federal uh, requirements for the drinking water for uh, that particular year. A um, couple of uh, things that have also been happening that are on the forefront is, I'm sure some of you are aware of the situation with milfoil in Paugus Bay and we're in the process of dealing with the Conservation Commission, Scott, and uh, DES in regards to trying to come up with what is um, agreeable by our parties in regards to trying to eradicate milfoil in Paugus Bay <clears throat> and still protect the drinking water uh, for the citizens. Uh, we finished up this year a three-year grant from DES on a leak survey so the entire system has been tested for leaks over the last three years, and that's been very beneficial to tightening up our system and hopefully cut down on any form of loss revenue. A um, couple of the larger things that we've done over the last year is about a million dollars worth of capital improvement funds. The primary projects there were the completion of North Main Street, a couple of loose ends on Lakeside Avenue, and then the rehabilitation of the steel elevated Long Bay tank, which was the lion's share of that particular money. Um, the budget that you have in front of you right now is basically 2.2%. Uh, that's kind of systematically the where we've gone over the years. And to give you an idea what that means, 2.2% is basically $61,000 in increased uh, O&M. In that budget, you'll see on the capital improvement page, there's about $600,000 in capital improvements, and there's $35,000 in a uh, contingency fund. The budget also has in it uh, placers for 2% cost of living and step increases. Step increases aren't that large because basically 50% of our workforce is, is maxed out due to longevity. You can see the capital projects on page 142 on your budget book. Um, the, big, the big issue that seems to be uh, looming its head over the water department right now is we are still seeing a reduction in gallons sold. And by that I mean over the last 17 years we have decreased 1% per year. 
Uh, we contribute that to conservation measures, washing machines, toilets, shower heads. So even with the steady unit growth that we've seen, we're still looking at a, uh, a, depreci um, a decrease of uh, gallons sold. So right now, um, the board is toying with an idea of doing a rate increase. We did the last rate increase uh, a little over two years ago. We did a very small rate increase and we only did it on the consumption amount because we were just obviously of the mindset that we'd like to do small increases at a shorter period of time. So I'm gathering some information for the board primarily because of the reduced consumption but also the fact that we at last year had about 2.2 million dollars in total available assets to us and because we spent one million dollars in capital we're down to about 1.2 and we have a couple of large projects coming up um, the primary one being uh, in conjunction with uh, DPW the relaying of the water main on Union Avenue from Main Street all the way to Guilford Ave. That's been a problematic area for us and right now the tentative schedule is that the water department's going in first and is going in in the spring of 19 so right around the corner. So the board is currently looking at bonding, rate increase, maybe a little combination of both. We're not heavily bonded at this point in time. Uh, we took out a $1.5 million bond to do the tank and the maintenance building years ago. And uh, we basically have about 80, 850,000 left on the principal and that's paid off in uh, 2029. So that's some of the situations that we're looking at from a department level in regards to the, the big picture to speak of I think everybody knows that we've been doing a lot of upgrades. We are doing probably a little less than $100,000 worth of work down on Court Street to uh, stay up with the upgrades that are currently under construction there. And I expect that to continue through the various stages of Court Street. Seth, a question on, on the rates. Um, if I remember right, didn't the council do a systematic uh, rate up? Uh, increase the rates over a period of years uh, between the water and the sewer and we do steps uh, that we we did that on the sanitary sewer fund probably about uh, five or six years ago and the council to its credit at the time I think looked at the big picture and and took a vote to set up those three step increases rather than coming back and needing an affirmative vote year after year. So those were in place, but that was strictly on, this, on sure. the sewer side. Okay. Um, and I believe, you know, Seth, I know probably has some numbers, but even with the small increase, increase the water department did last year, our rates across the state put us where against other communities? Yeah, basically, before we did the rate increase, we were fifth lowest out of 120 in a DES rate survey of 2015. And with the current rate we have now, we're only 13th on that 25th, 13th lowest out of 120. So by no means are our rates high, and that doesn't factor in what the, the um, departments below us have done over the last couple of years, because that data is not available. Um, I can go through, I can stay at the, the 30,000 foot level and go to capital. I can go through by line item um, I know capital is important to you. Um, we are anticipating, you'll see on uh, page 137, <coughs> um, we are anticipating basically a level income. It comes up to be a negative 0.2%. Um, That's primarily due to two things. Um, the state school is no longer on our system. So we lost some, conserva um, some consumption there as well as some unit charges. And again, um, our numbers are down as far as pumping. And I don't have the gallons billed for this particular year yet, but I do know that the hours at the treatment plant are running about five and a half hours a day right now, and they were six and a half hours a day last year. And I've got a couple little charts there that show that we're anticipating it to um, continue down, unless of course it stays dry and then we'll have a, a flush year. 
So the income basically is pretty well level funded. Again, I talked about the um, the O and M expenses, 2.2 percent. You'll see that on the bottom of page 140, where you see total expenses, and again, you can see where that correlates over to about $61,000. The, um, if you go to page 142, like Scott pointed out before. Except just one question. Certainly. It's okay. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Page 138 at the top. On our expenses, regular salaries in 16, 17, 754, and we go up uh, to 940 as the department requests for 1819. Is there an increase in the number of people you're employing? That seems like a pretty sizable jump in There was an increase salaries. in employees, um, but primarily that is due to um, the individuals that we've had in the department uh, becoming maxed out. And what else was that pointed to? The other thing is if you... And um, that's... I was going to say you have to yeah. add up in the holidays and vacation... Correct. You see this regular salaries of 754, and then two lines below that you see holidays, vacations, I do. sick and hurt. That is part of the 913 and the budgeted number for fiscal year 18, and until it's used, that's how it's allocated throughout the year. So if you were to add those up, you could probably come substantially closer to the 913. And for 17 and 18, 17, 18, 18, 19, it's, there's nothing there. That's why, right. Because <coughs> it's budgeted and we haven't actually right. occurred. I yeah. just quickly added them up, and they're about 885000 for the actual for sixteen seventeen. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Anything else so far? Or? Okay. Yeah, questions at this point? Yeah, just one, one quick one. Seth, is, is there any uh, cost containment that you could do over there to make the budget come out better, or...? about where you are we're we're running fairly tight yeah. um, comfortably so um, last year we did have a tail end of a dry season uh, we were able to come in on the ex under the expenses by four percent so basically we look at the budget point of view as what do we need worst case scenario to survive and then hopefully along the way we can save some money and, and just reinvest it for future capital so that's what this is, worst case scenario to survive, right? Yep. Okay. If you go over to uh, capital, a um, couple of, uh, you'll see over the past years, um, we've been doing a gate upgrade program because we were finding that the operating nuts were failing long before anything else. Same way with some hydrant repairs. The meter reading upgrade, we had a situation in which the um, electronic meter reading system was getting older and units started failing quickly. So we moved some capital money into that and we've got that reader program back up to speed. We've probably had to replace five to six hundred of the 6,600 units that we have in line. But that's the way of maintaining the reading and maintaining the income. So. Was that a warranty thing or? It was not a warranty thing. They do a uh, five-year, 100%. It's prorated after that. And there's nothing after 10 years. And the majority of them were failing between 12 and 14. So we pretty well took that on the chin. A yeah. um, couple things. You'll see we're placing the server. Uh, that's about six or seven years old. You'll see a loader in there for $65,000. $65,000 will not buy a loader. Um, so what we're doing there is we're going to set aside money each year for two or three years to replace the loader so that we don't lose out on some of the other items that we need for purchases. Uh, service truck in there and the rest of it, a couple of small things and... Uh, an additional <coughs> copier machine which prints all the uh, water and sewer bills. And it's, uh, it's time to replace that. 
If you go down to uh, projects, and all these projects are right now 100% coordinated with Public Works. Um, we've just been wrapping up on Bowman Street. I don't know if anybody's seen the, the, the mess we made down there, <laughs> uh, but we're getting it cleaned up and getting out of there by Friday if everything goes well. Um, Merrimack Street, you'll see that we've got 93,000 in there, and we also carried over 67,000 because that is now up to about 1,300 feet going from Pine all the way out to the new development. And we're not anticipating that to go as well as Bowman Street. It's ledgy. Um, I think that's going to be a, an expensive per foot street. Union Avenue, um, I was not able to carry in a budget like this enough money to fund the piece I talked about on Union Avenue from Maine to Guilford. So we're carrying a holder in there of $150,000. And the board, like I said, is in the process of deciding whether or not they're going to bond, rate increase, combination, how they're going to have those funds ready. Uh, we still do have some funds available uh, in savings, but that would run us lower than I think anybody's comfortable so with this operating. So you have $1.2 in cash on hand. Is that That's including accounts receivables. That's everything, yes. So that was, uh, what was the other number, two, even? Uh, last year we were 2.2. Now we're at 1.2. Right. So what are you going to be at this point next year? If I estimate Union Avenue at about $700,000, and I may have an extra fifty seventy-five coming in, um, it's going to be close. It's going to be five hundred, dollars uh, 400 depending upon how things go. We're having a, we're not having the best of years in water main breaks this year, so. So Seth and I have had some conversations about what the appropriate level to have an adequate reserve but not be carrying too much, and there's, there's not a lot of peer data out there to really look at it. This is where it's at. So we've taken a, you know, percentage of operating budget, as healthy amount for reserves, some unknowns, and, and kind of had those discussions. And I think that's why the, you know, the water department and the board have kind of stepped down from that 2.2 million, but nobody wants to run it down um, too low as well. So it's a, it's a balancing act. Seth. Councilor um, With all the, you know, the upgrades and things like that are being done over the last 10 years or whatever, what, what do you think the percentage is of underground water pipes that are still probably, you know, need to be replaced? <coughs> it's getting smaller. Our infrastructure is strong. I feel comfortable in saying that. We have probably about 100, 105 miles of pipe. Um, if you can only do a couple miles of pipe a year, you can see your kind of long term there. We depreciate water mains over 50 years and go looking for somewhere in the neighborhood of 90 years longevity. So um, we're in good shape, but we do have a couple more large items coming. Uh, sooner or later, there's going to have to be a joint venture on the Weirs Boulevard. I think some of you know that's been problematic for us. And it just seems like spending a half a million dollars isn't that hard anymore. Is, is the boulevard the whole length of the boulevard? Or? No. No, we're in good shape uh, up past the Lake Street area in that particular area. We have that pending contract with Brady Sullivan on Langley Cove where they're going to replace 1,900 feet of cast iron from our booster station up by the old St. Moritz, the Four Seasons entrance, back towards Langley Cove. The piece that we've got right now that's uh, going to be on us is going to be from our booster station to the roundabout. You have to go through the roundabout? No. No. All new pipe uh, in the roundabout when that was done, including distances well without, outside of it. And then uh, Franklin Street. That's another one that Wes and company have been working on. Uh, we've got some drainage issues, some gas work, and then we've got some old six-inch cast iron, and uh, that's scheduled in here. So our plan right now is to wrap up Bowman Street, get caught up on some things, start Merrimack Street just after July 4th, and probably be into Union Avenue um, the beginning of April. 
it's time to bid that contract. I know currently Busby has it, but I don't believe they're going to roll over the contract again. I don't believe they can. And uh, so it looks like it'll be a whole new uh, bid situation with Union Avenue being part of that. What, what's the price per on the water per uh, whatever you call it? Um, cubic foot. Cubic foot, yeah. What is that? What it is? Mm -hmm. Price per yeah. cubic foot. Yeah. What is it now? It's a dollar eighty per hundred cubic feet. So a hundred cubic feet is seven hundred and fifty gallons. Okay. So what do you feel it would need to be in order to make things move along well? That's what I'm working on right now, to be honest with you. Uh, the last one generated or was proposed to generate about $250,000 in income. Uh, we obviously probably lost a couple percent out of that due to the uh, reduction in sales. So right now we're factoring in some numbers. We're looking at adding a little bit to the base rate, a little bit to the consumption, a little to one or the other. But generally what I'm doing right now is coming up with spreadsheets um, to see how much money it will generate depending upon uh, which uh, direction the board wants to go. Uh, I'm a firm believer in doing rate increases every three or four years and keeping them small. Um, I think it's a lot easier for your average person to absorb, and I think it's easier to understand. Well, I think that's why we did the, <clears throat> the SOAR that way with the three steps, because we hadn't looked at that for, Since gosh, I don't remember how long. It was a long time. 2007. Yeah. That was just like about a five-year gap between that, so. I will note that it's 621. Any other questions for? One, one last question, ma'am. Go ahead. Seth, um, I see the 20,000 for meters. If you, I think you said 6,000 meters? Uh, we have uh, about 6,700 meters in the system. You've We're replaced 500. Give five to 700, depending upon their cycle. What, what's this going to take care of? This is going to take care of failed reading devices. So they're a little over $100 a piece. Uh, labor does not come out of this item. So this will take care of 175 probably not 200 additional failures if they continue to come in at the same rate that they have. Okay. Hope we're not using the same company, are we? We are. Um, that, was a, that was a long decision to make. Uh, I talked to a lot of people in the industry. They said don't ever change halfway because the reader people will blame the meter and the meter people will blame the reader. Um, and everyone's telling me that this isn't a surprise. It's industry-wide. So we did make the uh, decision to go with the same people. We were able to get to their, their upper players and get reduced rates. We're actually spending less money than we were, we were five to eight years ago per unit um, because we just weren't pleased, but they're not going to give anything away. I will note for the, uh, for the record and for our, I think everyone knows this, but just in case for the sake of our three new counselors that the Laconia Water Department is a is a self-sustaining enterprise fund and that no property tax dollars go to toward its operation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, gentlemen. All right, we're moving on to the assessing department and Deb Derrick. Before, if I could interrupt you for just a second, come on up. Sure. Do you have another one of these? Um, I don't. Okay. Who needs this, one? This is a mess. <laughs> Do you want mine? What's it starts on page 165, and it's just all garbled. If I can get, I'm going to get Nancy's off. Sure. Okay. We'll get to another one. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you all for <coughs> spending your time with me this evening. I'm Deb Derrick. I'm the assessor for the city. Um, I'm going to flip you to two different places. One, I'll kind of introduce what the assessing department does really quick. And if you're on page 34 of your budget, there's a quick paragraph on the bottom that pretty much explains that. Is this too loud or too close to my face? No, nope, just Okay. Right. And primarily, it's setting values equitably across the city for the bottom line, what's the city worth? 
and we, we do a sales evaluation every year to come to as close to market value, which the state requires between 90 and 110 percent of market value um, to be equitable. So we review all of the sales at, in the city, and analyze and do a statistical update yearly. In addition to that, we inspect, measure, reassess, including with the sales about 1,500 plus parcels throughout the city. We review and um, analyze all of the deeds and transfers that have taken place through the city. We, we document all those, post those. And given that, every year, as I said, we do a sales analysis. My handout to you tonight um, shows what we have looked like over the last five years. So if you want to look at my cute little handout, the sales trends <coughs> in the dollar ranges have been set um, comparing the last five years. And as you'll see, for 2018, we're up 4% over 2017 and about 20% over 16 and 43% over 15. So we've been trending up nicely. Most of the sales have been under the $250,000 range, but we've had some nice ones in the mid-range, 250 to 500,000. I'll just interrupt for one second. So the assessing year, as those of you who have been here a while, you've oh, heard me sorry. say, the assessing year begins under or in conjunction with state law, Department of Revenue Administration on April 1st, <coughs> and it runs through March 31st. So every community is on that cycle for an assessing year. So when we're talking 18, we're talking the assessing year that just ended uh, six weeks or so ago. And we're in the process now of those five, uh, 519 sales, we're in the process of reviewing those, making sure they are arm's length or qualified transactions in order to use for our statistical update. So we take all of the ones that would not qualify out and set our values based on those that are qualified. On the second page, we have a sales trends by category. So it's um, kind of interesting to note um, on paper to see that condominiums and single family homes, residential homes, have been the highest and most active sales throughout time, actually. So that is, Mr. Lippman, I'm working on the, and I'm on the second page of that. Thank you. So the condominiums have been, in the last couple of years, have really been on quite a rise and still going pretty strong. The sales progression is another picture of, by line draft, how, how it shows over the years. Average and median sales have trended upward in the last couple of three years. Um, then we get into after we do our sales update and new values are set and tax rates set and they go out, we have an abatement process where people who are aggrieved of their value, don't agree with their value, question whether they're equitable, maybe their property's not measured and listed accurately. There's many different factors that they might file an abatement for. This past year we had 59, the prior year 85. So. That was a pretty good picture, considering that the sales last year were quite high and there were numerous increases, especially with waterfront properties and um, condominiums, that that was a good chance that we were pretty much in the market and people weren't too perplexed by changes. The number of foreclosures went from 12 to 23 over the past year. And then the last page, is a line drawing of what the net valuation of the city for the last 10 years is, was, to show you the trend of how things are happening since the downturn in 2007, 2008, to where we're going right now. That's a little bit of what we've done for the past year. And then if you want to turn to your budget pages, I don't need 15 minutes. 
<laughs> um, if you want to turn to your budget pages, we're pretty level-ended. We're um, staying pretty much where we Mr. have been. I just ask a question. Yeah, can we stop for a second? Councilor oh, Hayes? definitely. I'm, I'm just, done. I'm just curious. Uh, what would you? Is there some kind of trend with the foreclosures? You never know. Some people will overextend themselves. This 23 foreclosures is pretty low for a whole year. So it's when people No, I was just curious. It yeah. jumped from 12 to 23. Right. Like and double. being small numbers, it doubled. But no. If we carried that back to 2011 and 12, we probably had numbers well over 100 those yes. years. So we were yes. up here during the down in the economy. Yeah. And then they kind of leveled off. But again, sometimes... Um, you know, as, as Deb said, economy gets a little stronger, people overextend a little bit because they're feeling good, and sometimes it catches up with them a little bit. So that, that number definitely has dropped significantly, and we're probably, you know, in a, in a good trend right now in those numbers in the teens and the 20s. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So we're still about, am I reading this correctly, $100 million short of peak in terms of getting back to where we were in 2007? About. <coughs> yep. Roughly $100 million. Right. And this is the taxable, so the overall, when you, we, we backed out um, nonprofits, we backed out valuation of city school-owned property, that type of stuff. So this is the base that will match up with the numbers in your budget book. So we, we went down three, almost $400 million. Mm -hmm from top to bottom and we're back to within a hundred million of where we were right. 2007. Is that uh, 2.16 is that with the non-taxable properties you think? No. For, uh, no this is seven. apples and apples so this is okay. all this is a, just the taxable base so non-profit city-owned properties are excluded from this. I think the whole number if we backed everything into it is about 2.5 million. Yes. So it's about 400 million either city-owned nonprofit owned citywide. Well, one of you wants to build a hundred million dollar house, we'll be right back where we <laughs> and, and Deb, when's the last time we went outside and hired a firm to do an entire citywide revaluation in one year? Was that was before 2010. my two thousand and ten. Okay, and do you recall how many abatement requests we had that following year? Roughly? Oh, a lot. There were uh, hundreds? Yes. Yeah, close to two. Okay, so when you look at the abatement numbers here, they're relatively low in comparison. One of the things I've been working with the department and Deb on over the last couple of years is to perform cyclical updates. So in essence, we try to we look at the building permits, every building permit we go out and visit, every sale we go out and, and we visit. Beyond there, we try to hit a certain number of additional properties to cover 20% of the residential properties on an annual basis. And by doing those types of cyclical updates, our objective is to hit every residential property for one reason or another on a five-year cycle. And that stops the need typically to hire a firm for close to $200,000? At least. At least to come in and perform that. And a lot of times the complaint is that firm doesn't understand Laconia, they don't know our neighborhoods, they don't know our houses, and the abatements go uh, significantly higher, which causes staff time and in some cases uh, adds significantly to legal cost if people take those appeals all the way up to, uh, you know, uh, BTLA or court. Um, so. The cyclical, I think, keeps us current, keeps us within the uh, quality ranges that, uh, that signify quality, you know, quality assessing within market valuation and fair assessing, and um, I think we're having success with that, and I think a lot of that ties into that low number of abatements and a relatively, you know, consistently low number of abatement requests um, that come in, so. Okay, you're on to your budget. My budget stays the same. I'm asking for $27,000 for the bare bones, minimums, whatever. I have pretty much it's flat. You see in my request, in the department request, there was a $25,000 request. And that we had agreed that we're not going to look into for this year, but our camera, our computer, computer assisted, um, yep, just went right out of my head. The program that we use for our assessments is vision appraisals. And in the next two or three years, they will not be using the same background format as they are now because Microsoft is doing away with 
what's called SQL or SQL. No, it's Oracle. We're going to SQL. So they're rewriting their programming and will be on a new format, but it doesn't have to be done until about 2020. So I plugged it in there this year to, you know, to look forward to the future because we're going to have to upgrade our camera system. And we also didn't want to be the one of the first communities going in as a yes. more of a beta site and be in the test yes. candidate. We'd rather let it roll out somewhere else and let them work a few of the bugs, if there are any, out before we jump in. So we'll phase that in somewhere over the next year or two. Other than that, everything is pretty much it's all the same. <clears throat> I'm not asking for any more than we had before. Any questions for Mrs. Derrick? Just very generally, if I can take a couple of her minutes that she's yielded to uh, away from her department, as a general comment, uh, when you go through the budget book, you'll note that with the three largest departments in the city, police, fire, and public works, contained within them are uh, not only the salaries, but I call them the above the line, above the line, the personnel items. So you'll see health insurance cost, retirement system cost are all built into those budgets. With the smaller departments, assessing, library, city hall, parks and rec, they're all built in one page under the fiscal budget. So sometimes when numbers look larger on a personnel, you've got to remember that in the smaller departments, this is salary, the benefits show up under a fiscal page. So it's <coughs> not quite an apples to apples when you want to compare an overall increase in one department to another because they don't all contain the same items. And that was set up that way when I started here back in 2011. I think most likely it was because the three largest departments truly do dwarf most of the other departments and I think the, the thought was to show those big items in there for their full cost and then carry the smaller departments on one page. So you'll see that thread as we go through the budget. And our, for our, that part of page, on um, page 34, that's a standard like up to 5% based on <coughs> where we fall in the yearly, um, just went right out of my head. Thank you. Any other questions? Any questions? Okay, thank you. We appreciate You're welcome. it. Thank you all. Thanks, Deb. And uh, now we're to library, and I see Mr. Moriarty and Mr. Bro here tonight. Welcome, gentlemen. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Councilors. John Moriarty, uh, Chairman of the Library Board of Trustees, joined by uh, Veteran Library Director Randy Bro. I'd like to officially say welcome to uh, the new councilors in the room. I, uh, I think I've said hello to a couple of you, but uh, uh, it's nice to have... Um, everyone's consideration and uh, we uh, appreciate all that you do. Uh, it's nice to know that in the library world uh, the one sage truth is that people are still reading books. Uh, that's nice that they are remaining literate and uh, tactile with paper and uh, in the printing press. Uh, just as an example we had 118,000 visits to the library in the previous year and in fact circulated uh, a rock solid 104,000 items. So uh, that is a testament to the, the value that we serve the, uh, the patrons and the population of uh, Laconia. Uh, if you would permit me to talk a little bit about uh, one thing that I think we're happy to see is that uh, you're aware that there's sort of three categories of uh, collections that, that we consider. Uh, the actual items that we have tangible items within our walls is our collection. That number is about 60,000 items. Uh, in addition to that, of course, you're familiar with interlibrary loans where we can put in a request from other libraries throughout the, the consortium or the state or even the country. Uh, but in addition, there are other library type functions that are popping up and we have availed ourselves of them. I'd like to speak specifically for a moment about a service called Hoopla which might to some of you resemble uh, Netflix or those sort of uh, types of uh, uh, streaming services. Uh, so in the library world, Hoopla uh, has uh, quite a collection. Um, I can't actually tell you what the number is, but I can tell you last month they, had, they added 900 items to their collection of uh, e-books, audio books, uh, music, TV shows, and movies. So all, all our patrons need to do is make sure their library card is up to date, 
uh, use the last four digits uh, in the library card number on the back and from the comfort of their mobile device or home computer uh, log into the Hoopla site and avail themselves of those 900 new items that were just added to our collection. So the growth of that, uh, just in terms of return on investment, is pretty substantial. Uh, looking at the numbers, and we are looking at April, uh, pardon me, May of last year through April of this year. So we've given you <coughs> the most 12 current months compared to the 12 months before that. We saw an increase from 3,500 to 5,600 uh, unique users of Hoopla, which is an increase of 43% over one year. So we're very happy with those numbers. Uh, so that, that uh, kind of gives you an indication of some of the things that we're paying attention to. I'll talk a little bit more at the end, if I can, about uh, what we're paying attention to for the following year. But uh, you see that our budget is, uh, is more or less in line with uh, our previous year. We did uh, have a, uh, uh, we had some veteran staff retire and uh, one take a, a, a wonderful opportunity for herself. So we've had three staff members that were near the top of the pay uh, steps uh, replaced with three less veteran members. So uh, the, the time that we actually submitted our uh, proposal, we, we hadn't hired the final uh, individuals. I think that happened around April 19th. So you can see that, in fact, our salaries have a, have a nice decline of about $23,000, which we're happy to pass along to the taxpayers of the city of Laconia. Uh, obviously, we're relying less on print-based overdue notices, and so I think it's a good decision to, uh, to reduce the, uh, uh, the postage number by $500. We're going to work to even reduce that more next year if we can, uh, relying on email notices and emailed newsletters and, and the like. Uh, and uh, so I think that probably explains most of the of the numbers. I entertain any questions you have, um, but I'd also like to talk for oh um, one other thing we did uh, last year that I I think we're all pretty happy with. You recall that um, our front steps uh, from Church Street there are a number of staircases and ramps. It's quite a complicated entrance uh, to look at or maintain, but it's, it serves the purpose of getting both pedestrians and wheelchair and baby strollers up to the, and into the building. And uh, that 10-year entrance or 12-year-old entrance uh, had suffered quite a bit of ice damage. And uh, working with the, the uh, purchasing office here and, uh, um, and the sort of per unit cost of what a, what a cubic yard of concrete, et cetera, we were staring down the face of $110,000 to uh, repair that staircase. And uh, so with our friends at Bonapage and Stone and Mask on Concrete and ultimately a company called Associated Concrete, we were able to make a skim coat epoxy veneer repair to that that uh, came in just under $11,000. So we're mighty happy to to have that 90 some odd thousand, 100,000 dollars in savings. So uh, again, I think that's all, and that's all, that work is all complete as of uh, four or so weeks ago. Uh, if I could just move on, a couple of things that we're paying attention to. Um, we use a, a piece of software and a series of databases uh, that reside on two servers within the library to uh, look after our collection. It does our inventory control, checks books in and out shows the public what's available. We have pictures of book jackets like you're familiar with on Amazon. We bought that. Uh, it was a special project of uh, former city manager Dan McKeever. And uh, we invested about, a, I don't know, it was a hundred and some odd thousand dollars in, our, in uh, digitizing all our records. And, uh, and that was the whole computerization that, that occurred in 2001. And uh, we've been a little reluctant to, to rock the boat with that substantial of investment, but uh, you think about how the world has changed since 2001. Uh, people weren't browsing on their mobile devices. Uh, all that information had to be held on our servers because the connection speeds were too slow to move thousands of book jackets to, to our users. So the, the days of having to store our own data and maintain two servers at $10,000 a piece on a five-year cycle may very well be over. So we're looking to the following fiscal year, perhaps to, uh, to be able to implement a change that would save that maintenance cost. Uh, and by the way, our, our real software licensing costs are $15,000 a year. So I can't give you any numbers. We're just, the trustees are just at the beginning of uh, sort of looking into this and <coughs> working with the city IT department and uh, the library professionals. But hopefully when we're here 
again, we have some really good news for you, uh, given the scale of our budget. So uh, am I neglecting anything? I think you covered your major points, yes. Good. Any, any questions that I can entertain? Councilor Hamill. <coughs> um, John, <coughs> what kind of programs or capital investment are you making at the Gale Memorial Library? You're talking uh, brick and mortar kind of investments? Yeah, that or books or, you know, people there or, you know, what's going on at the Gale Library? Then? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask for Randy to answer part of that question, then I'll come back and follow up. Well, we've always had a commitment to uh, have programming going on for all ages, from little kids to older folks. We had Tai Chi out on the lawn last Friday with Sensei Jones. Can we get you to uh, use the mic? Please, Randy. Sorry. Yes. So we, we continue that focus on programming. We have a healthy program budget that's uh, listed here, and uh, we'll, we'll continue that commitment to, to do that. We have a new, uh, one of the three people we hired was a teen librarian, and so we've kind of reinvigorated our focus on teen programming. So, um, you know, we're doing those things. We're looking at some more. Uh, John talked about fixing those concrete steps. Every four or five years, we have a, another uh, tradesman come up to look at the slate roof because over the winters, we start losing some. They get loose. They fall off. Um, so that, uh, that firm will be up this summer um, with a 120-foot lift to go around the roof, replacing what needs to be replaced in terms of the slate. <coughs> and they check the copper flashing, the crickets, all that, all that stuff on the roof. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a historic building, and it's a beautiful building, but we, we feel like we're... Uh, that's, that's part of our job is to make sure that looks good and it is uh, in good shape for the public. So, okay, so you are looking to put capital in there as far as keeping the building up to snuff and, oh, yes. and the programs running? Yes. Okay. I mean, we want people, it's they a beautiful building uh, to see from the here, street, but we, we want, the bottom line is we want to get people into the building yeah. to see the 60,000 items that we have to, to be checked out <coughs> and to uh, avail themselves of all the programs that we put on. Okay, great. Thanks, Randy. Yep. You may recall in uh, 2005 when we did the bonded library project, uh, one or two of those bonds required a service life of 22 and a half years. So at 12 years in, we're, uh, we're just scratching the surface on what we hope will be a 100-year addition. Uh, so the good news is that programmatically, uh, the building is meeting our needs as designed. And so it's a, it's a matter of doing the upkeep and maintenance on the, on the physical brick and mortar. And uh, we all know that deferred maintenance costs more than ongoing maintenance, so we're, we're keeping up with all of that, whether it's front steps or all the things that uh, Randy just mentioned. Uh, it, programmatically, it's, it's interesting. Uh, it's the, you never really can predict what a good program is going to be. We've got our feelers out trying to, trying to understand what our patrons in the community want to do. Of course, uh, we're always thinking about what's going to happen in downtown uh, down the road uh, in terms of <clears throat> seating capacity, and I think you understand my innuendo. But uh, our budget, of, I think, it was $12,000 a year. We do, we do quite a few programs. Our Rotary Hall is, uh, is busy three days a week. Uh, and uh, we're trying to, you know, our mission at the library is uh, not only research and reference and entertainment, but uh, it's, it, of course, emphasizes, emphasizes literacy and, uh, and, and thinking and, and participating in a social, uh, you know, in society. Um, but we've, we're also looking at some interesting things that uh, may not be done thoroughly anywhere in the Lakes region, that is technological literacy. And I don't know for sure if we're talking about coding or robotics, but uh, stay tuned, we're paying attention to those opportunities because as, as, our as our society changes, of course, we're gonna be relying on more animation to take care of all of us. Uh, we hope to have technologically literate uh, technicians that uh, will, will be able to rise to that challenge. So we, we see that as a new vector in our offerings here at the library. Anyone else? Questions, comments? Can I, I'm gonna, now we're talking about programming. I want to make a quick plug for a really great program next Thursday night, May 24th, if you're uh, able to come out that evening. Ben Killam, who's the, you may have heard of him, he's the authority on black bears in the state, and he's, he has a facility where he raises cubs that have been deserted. Or um, He's going to be coming, he's going to be at the library next Thursday evening doing a program on his work with 
with bears. So if you're free, I believe it's at 7 o'clock next Thursday. Come on by. We've had him, had him about six or seven years ago, and it was well attended then. But he's, he's a great, great speaker. And I don't think he's bringing a bear with him, but he'll have pictures. Is he the one from uh, the Peterborough area? Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Just another item to point out as we're starting our budget discussion. So, and I, I think uh, Mr. Moriarty brought this up. When you look at the salary line item, you'll see where it's changed from what was the department request 1819 to what was in the final manager line item. And that's not because I've changed, you know, gone out and reduced positions or said they can't have them. A lot of times we start to work on the budget in December and our human resource department is starting to put together numbers based on current employees, current salaries, those types of things. And then as we work through a couple of months and I finally present the budget towards the end of April, we've had changes sometimes in departments. So that's a more accurate reflection. Some of the guesswork, if you will, comes into if we know we've got an employee, we typically know what health insurance plan that they're on if they've taken city health insurance. Sometimes we have a vacancy or, in say in the case of police department, a couple of vacancies, you know, we, we don't always know what those hires are going to be looking like um, in terms of the benefits they get. We know what the starting salary would be. So we make some assumptions, but you might see a few places in different departments where what was a request was reduced, and again, it wasn't a change in staffing per se. It was just updated census numbers based on who we had at that given time. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, guys. Okay, we have no other business tonight in this special meeting. Um, so I will declare the meeting adjourned at uh, 6.51 p.m. and we'll uh, reconvene at 7.